joining the MoneyWise webinar on good credit and new developments in credit reporting. As Audrey said, I'm Nelson Santiago. I am one of the presenters today during my portion of the webinar. I will familiarize everybody with MoneyWise and what it has available for you, as well as re-familiarize those of you who maybe have used it in the past. After that, we will hear from our very special guest presenter from Experian, Rod Griffin, who will talk to us all about credit reports and provide us with a lot of new information that we will want to take back to the communities that we serve. With regard to MoneyWise, uh, MoneyWise is a project of, that Consumer Action developed in partnership with Capital One Bank over 10 years ago. And over the years, it has grown to include several <clears throat> educational modules, and they are listed on the screen now. They include some of the traditional basic financial literacy topics like tracking your money, which is our money management module, banking basics, and saving to build wealth, as well as the two credit modules that we're looking at today, the good credit and the rebuilding credit. There's a module uh, targeting teens, all about money. It's actually almost a, a full course in itself, including some information on credit, banking, even insurance information. There are also some less traditional uh, topics that you, that you don't normally see in uh, financial education curriculum, uh, including the micro-business module, uh, module on elder fraud or senior scams, the identity theft module, two modules on home ownership. One is on, on buying a home. The other one is for post-purchase successful home ownership tips. And then there is also the module on personal bankruptcy. We refer to these as modules. Uh, because they have several components. One of them, you're seeing images here of the brochures. These are the ones that are translated into five languages, English, Spanish. They're available in English, Spanish, Korean, Vietnamese, and Chinese. Got a notice here. Uh, these are the brochures. So I apologize about that. These are the brochures that you would want to have on hand to um, <clears throat> either have in your lobbies, to give out during workshops, and also to... Um, uh, to maybe take to community events and community fairs and use that at exhibit tables. In addition to the brochures, there is also the leader's guide. This one is in English, is only available in English, and it's intended as a tool for the presenter to help prepare for workshops, as well as to um, uh, maybe anticipate questions that you're going to get in workshops, or even to have handy by your desk. There are a lot of resources websites, phone numbers in here that you might want to give to consumers. Also, the, the next component is the lesson plan. All of the modules have a lesson plan. And the lesson plan is exactly what it, what it sounds like it is. It is a guide for putting together a workshop. It has suggested times to spend on particular topics. Uh, it has activities, and it has um, handouts that you can give in workshops. The activities are translated into English and Spanish, and by the way, all of this is um, available for download, and you should also already have received it as part of the materials that were made available before the workshop or before the webinar. There's a PowerPoint slide set for each of the modules. I refer to these as the default set that you can use and tailor to fit your audience. So you may have only a certain amount of time available. Uh, you may want to add local resources. And there may be some sections that, that you won't cover depending on the needs of your clients and the time that you have available. Five of the modules have been developed as computer-based learning sessions. And these are um, in intended as an enhancement to, to what you may be doing with the other modules. And these are available in English and Spanish. And uh, community organizations have told us that when they already have clients, say, working in computer labs, it is, uh, these are handy to have uh, so that consumers can work on them while they're in the computer labs. They, have, um, they cover some of the same concepts as the other modules, but include different uh, educational articles, hypothetical case studies, um, also um, <clears throat> some quizzes and printable tip sheets. All of this information that we're talking about is available, or you can find it through our the MoneyWise website. You can see the website address right at the bottom, money-wise.org. And at any time you go to this website, you will see on the right, on, on all of the pages, you will see all 12 modules, and you see them listed here. 
in this particular slide, I've already selected tracking your money, and then I've gone ahead and selected the brochure uh, in order to, to look at the brochure. Um, what the other thing you can do at the website is order the materials. And here I'm zooming in a little bit more on the uh, senior scams brochure uh, that I got to through the MoneyWise website, uh, just so that you can see how, how it can be ordered. Uh, first of all, as you can see here, you can actually download. All of these are downloadable, downloadable in PDF format, and they're also readable just right on the screen in, in HTML format. But we do encourage you to uh, order these because uh, you'll get a colorful set of brochures that you can use in, in uh, workshops and, and in community events, as I mentioned earlier. Um, how to order them, there are a couple of options. You can click, as you see at the bottom, uh, the the bullet right under order publications, you have MoneyWise online order form. If you click on that, you'll actually be able to create an account and um, then order them, select the material that you like and put them in a shopping cart. It almost works like your favorite shopping site online. But unlike your favorite shopping site, there are no charges whatsoever, not even for shipping. Uh, if the traditional way to order is to print and fax the order form, if you click the bottom uh, bullet, you will see the the, um, the order form on the right uh, open up or download, and you can fill out that with the materials that you want and fax it in. You can order up to 40 uh, publications or 40 brochures in each language at a time of each of the modules, and five uh, leader's guides of each of the modules. Uh, you can order as often as you like, but we do limit each individual order to, to 40 for the brochures and five for the leader's guides but again, order as often as you like. The other way you can get to the order forms is from our main website. Should you ever forget something I just said a while ago, just go to consumer-action.org. That is our main website. You can click on publications at the, across the top of the, of the main page and then select how to order. That takes you to this, uh, this page that has the uh, instructions on ordering as well as the order forms for all of our projects, and you see those over on the right. MoneyWise is listed there, and there are several more that follow MoneyWise if you actually go to the actual website. Now we'll spend a few minutes on the good credit module. This is, like I said, today's focus is all about credit. Um, this is really one of my favorite modules because it's got something in here for all kinds of people, whether maybe you're talking to young adults who are starting their financial lives, who are maybe thinking about getting their first credit card, um, or aspiring homeowners, maybe people living in transitional housing who are going to go out and get their, their apartment, um, even small business owners, people who have already started their small business but realize that their personal credit is going to matter when it comes to getting a, a, a business loan. A small business owners are among the best audience for this subject, actually. So if any of you work with them, you will, you will see that. Um, what, the module, what this module covers is why, um, why consumers need credit, the steps to take to build credit, um, how to monitor how well your credit is doing, and some tips on using it responsibly. This first slide here, that, uh, and we're only covering a few of the slides. Like I said, there's a default set, and we encourage people to select the slides that they need for, when, for the time they have available. So we're looking at one of the slides that talks about, uh, gives you a chance if you're presenting this workshop uh, to talk about why it's important to have credit. I sometimes run into people who say, you know, I'm, I'm of the, I'm of the uh, thinking that I'd rather not borrow money. I don't want to owe anyone money. Or maybe some people have problems in the past, and they don't want to use credit, but you know there are some reasons why ultimately many of us want to establish good credit. Uh, buying a home is one of them. I'm going to jump to the next slide to show you something from the FICO website that shows what might happen to somebody who's going to uh, get a $300,000 mortgage uh, based on their credit score. This tells you what kind of interest rate they're going to pay and what they might, might, what they might pay as a monthly payment. So here the person with the best score. 760 is getting a 3.6% interest rate on this $300,000 mortgage and paying 1364. The person with a 620 uh, or to 639 is getting a 5.19 interest rate and paying 1,645 for the exact same 30-year mortgage. So that's almost $300 more per month and over $100,000 over the 30 years. So um, this is one reason why it'd be important for someone who's going to buy a home to 
uh, take steps to build credit, not only because they may pay more or for the mortgage, but perhaps they won't even be able to get a mortgage if they haven't taken steps to build credit. Another reason listed here, uh, getting a job. A lot of employers across the country are, are check, checking credit. They want to learn a little bit about the employees or the applicants' uh, character, uh, you know, responsibility. Um, they may also think that a, a, an employee or potential employee who has a lot of credit problems might have an incentive to steal from the company or might be susceptible to bribes. Now, <clears throat> We're not saying that we agree with that, with that kind of reasoning, but it is what is happening. And some states do limit how or when employers can check credit, but even in those states that limit it, uh, they often um, they have exceptions. So that you know they might say, well, you can't check credit on everybody, but but you can check it if it's for a law enforcement position, a management position, a position where people are handling money or sensitive information and things like that. And so I say that you know the people that we reach, we want them to have all of the opportunities possible in terms of employment. So so credit would still be important for them. You'd want to check with your state department of labor or even your city. Some some cities have passed ordinances. Um, you'll want to check with them to see if there are limitations in your state. Now renting an apartment is another reason to have good credit. Here we're not borrowing money, but there are landlords who will say, I have five applicants, I'm going to give this apartment to the person with the best score. What does that do to the person who hasn't taken steps to build credit? That would leave them out. They wouldn't have the opportunity if they don't even have a credit score, potentially. So that, that's one, one important reason. Financing a car. This is similar to what we said about uh, how buying a home. The better your credit score, the better interest rates you will get. And so here we're looking at um, some information I found on a website of a car dealership in Southern California. They're very, very honest about what, what's going to happen depending on your credit score. The person with the best credit score here is getting a 4.95 interest rate. The person with the worst credit score is getting uh, more than five times that at, uh, at 22.9 or four to five times that. I'm going to back up one more time. Uh, spreading out payments for expensive items. This is another reason we need credit. And we talked about, you know, you, that the kinds of expensive items we're talking about are buying a home, financing a car, hopefully not that vacation in the Caribbean. Qualifying for insurance is another important reason for having good credit. Uh, insurance companies will look at credit information, credit scores to decide uh, whether we can get home or auto insurance and how much we can pay for it. Uh, there is an article from United Policyholders, an advocacy group, and I've given you all the link to that in the materials you got, that tells us, you know, when, when two consumers are the same in all respects except their credit score, the person with the worst score could pay two, three, or four times more than the person with, with the, with, than the person with the best score for their home or auto insurance. So it, it can be, uh, pretty severe. I don't know if anyone was able to see a copy of the Consumer Reports issue for September. They did some new research on this, uh, focusing on auto insurance, and they also posted it on their website um, where they showed just what a severe impact really poor scores can have on, on insurance, uh, auto insurance rates. Um, and they do, they do a state-by-state -state comparison. You can find that at consumerreports.org slash fix car insurance. They, sh they found, for example, that um, uh, a, credit, a credit score can do more harm to, to the uh, auto insurance rates than um, even driving while under the influence. So take a look at that, and we can send a link to you all later, but it, it's pretty astounding. Uh, you need credit to get credit to get a loan at the best rates, right, and to hopefully avoid predatory loans or loans that are, uh, have bad terms. And also, I like to talk about uh, credit cards um, <clears throat> when, I, when I talk about this and talk about the advantages that credit cards have over other types of plastics in terms of, for example, protection when, when there's unauthorized use. The other key uh, topic covered in the good credit module is how to establish credit. So here are a few tips, uh, things like going to the local, a local company, maybe a local furniture store, a local electronics store that offers things on credit. Uh, the key point there would be to make sure that the information is being 
uh, passed on to or given to the credit bureau than it's actually showing up in a credit report. Um, I I've talked before about a, a consumer who called their hotline who had bought things for years on credit at a local furniture store, only to learn later that it never, nothing ever ended up in her credit report. Um, had she been checking uh, every year, she would have found out sooner. Um, the other tip here is uh, to use a cosigner. If somebody, say, is going to buy a car, they can get a cosigner that already has good credit. That will help the new person establish their credit. Again, you'd want to keep track and make sure that this information is making it to the credit reports. Uh, <clears throat> then the most recommended way to, to establish credit is to use a secured credit card. These work just like regular credit cards uh, issued by banks and credit unions, except consumers will have to deposit money in a savings account, maybe a CD, and that money stays there uh, while the consumer uses a secured card. It acts as security, it acts as collateral, uh, and it is one of the most recommended ways to, to establish credit. I'll show you a resource for that in just a moment. Um, the, the idea with these ways to establish credit is that once you take these steps, if you use credit responsibly for a year or two, pay, pay your bills, don't bounce checks, get the payments in, then you will be able, you'll be on the road to establishing good credit and then open up accounts um, just like anybody else does who has good credit. In terms of the secured cards, we did do a secured card survey uh, now a few years ago, but I, I still have it here because of the very good articles that are in it, uh, written by our DC office actually. Um, we have information on you know, choosing a card and avoiding cards that charge a lot of fees. So very good articles, you'll want to check it out. Uh, the link is there, but it's also in the resources that you received already. Uh, we also talk all about credit reports in this module. I will not spend too much time on this now because we have experience. We're lucky enough to have experience on today. So um, it, the module does cover what the credit reports are, what's in them, who are the three credit reporting, or which are the three major credit reporting bureaus, and like you see here, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. We talk about in the module of, of how consumers can get their credit reports from all three bureaus. Uh, what, um, every 12 months, they can get a free report. And the if the website is here, the phone number. I also like I like to get it by mail. And in the resources resources that you have, you have a link to the order form so that you can order this by mail. Also, uh, we have here the information that will be required in order to get the the report. The modules les lesson plan also has sample credit reports from all three bureaus. Experian, and I usually tend to do a little activity, you know, having consumers look for particular companies in the report and talking about whether the account was handled well, et cetera. And then I usually ask my little trick question about where's the credit score? And that lets me talk about how the credit score is not something that comes with your free credit report, but generally you would have to buy that separately if you wanted it with the credit report. And we will hear a little bit more about scores from, from Rod in a little while. Uh, then uh, a few words on the rebuilding good credit module. This is the other module that deals with uh, credit. Uh, it covers all the basic concepts that we were just talking about in terms of building credit and the importance of credit, but then focuses on some of the issues that could come up for people who are having credit problems. So dealing with collection agencies, for example, if it talks about how if you don't recognize the loan, you don't recognize this creditor, you can ask for verification where to complain about collection agencies, getting collection agencies to stop contacting you. Um, there's a relatively new resource from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, a lot of good sample letters that can be sent to collectors. I have that resource in the materials that were already sent to you. Um, also, the module focuses on credit repair scams. These are um, uh, all kinds of scams that try to tell consumers that everything can be fixed you know, very easily. Um, I also include supplements supplementary material on some of the credit relief scams that are out there. Companies that say, if you owe $10,000, we can cut that in half. So I've included those resources in the materials that you received. <clears throat> and then we point people to the, to the legitimate counseling resources. So these would be members of the National Foundation for Credit Counseling. You'll see that in the slide in just a moment. Um, and then, of course, tips on rebuilding credit, including paying any accounts that are still existing, paying those on time, and taking some of the same steps that we talked about earlier, like getting a co-signer and um, uh, maybe becoming an authorized user on a credit card, as well as um, 
as well as getting a secured card. I mentioned that the lessons have activities in them. This is just a, a, a sort of a screenshot of one of the activities. Uh, this is a, an ad that somebody might see. It could be an email. It could be a text message nowadays. It could be anything where somebody is trying to tell you that they can fix your credit. And so you get to talk about what, what is wrong with this picture, right? And you also get to talk about what is right with this picture, this next one. This is this would be the legitimate ad that points you to, to a legitimate resource. Another activity, uh, supplementary activity that you can download for this is uh, 12 Tips for Good Credit. Um, this is kind of like the activities that maybe we did in grade school. If anybody has uh, been to one of my workshops, you'll see that you'll know that I usually blow this up into poster size and have people work on it as a team. And it gives you a chance to talk about all the different subjects in it without necessarily uh, making it part of the lecture. So you can save some of it for, for what's in the activity. I'll show you one of the questions now and ask everyone to, to give us their response. So here's one of the questions from this activity. The official site for obtaining a free credit report is blank. Uh, if you could, Audrey, if you could tell them to type in the letter and let me know what people respond. What would be the answer to this? Which letter? Okay. Any responses coming in? The first, we have a couple different responses. The majority is P. We did have one person that responded I and one person that responded B as in boy, but the majority of the responses were P, and then we had one response of L. Right, and so what this, this is not a trick question. What's the official site for obtaining a free credit report? It is not I, if anyone can look, because there's a misspelling there. That's not intended as a trick, but really to emphasize the point that there are a lot of fake websites out there, and you can talk about those. There may be recent media attention on some of these uh, fake sites that you can bring in some articles that relate to it, and so the, the correct answer here is P. So you know, that, that's the way that, that I do this, and e each one gives me a chance to talk about a particular topic. Um, lastly, I just wanted to point out a couple of the resources that you already received. One is resources for good credit, a ton of additional resources, including uh, information on freezing your credit, including on the credit card laws, also the debt relief companies that I mentioned earlier. Lots of my favorite Federal Trade Commission uh, handouts are here, including those on, on dealing with um, fake debt collectors and old debt that is maybe no longer collectible, that, that sort of thing. Uh, those resources are here. And then um, the last resource I'll mention is this uh, classic little fact sheet that we have um, with uh, several steps that consumers can take in order to improve their finances. And the idea being that almost in any workshop that you give, uh, somebody can take one of the steps on here whether it's getting a checking account if they're not part of the financial mainstream yet, ordering a credit report, even taking another look at their um, at their budget. And there's a few more tips on here. So you already have this. Um, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn over to Rod Griffin of Experian to hear all about credit reports. Although I could stop for a moment for a couple of questions, Audrey, if there are any, any that I can answer now. Nelson, no one has typed in a question. I think you can go ahead and move on to Rod. Okay, we will have time for questions at the end. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you much, and thank you, Audrey, for having me today. Uh, I, again, I'm Rod Griffin. I'm Director of Public Education. And there are really about three things I want to do today. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about Experian and why I'm here and our philosophy around why we have somebody like me doing consumer education and, and uh, training, uh, and then talk about some changes we're seeing in the credit scoring marketplace and uh, about some changes that are underway in our industry. Uh, and then I want to share a few things that we've uh, seen in a survey uh, about credit scores and what makes a credit score rocks, what I think of as a rock star versus a roadie with credit scores. So looking at some information about what makes someone with great credit scores have those great credit scores and why people with very poor scores have poor scores. And I hope to shed some light on or clarify the real issues around uh, credit scoring and what, what different, differentiates people. So, And then I want to answer your question. So 
I want to spend less time talking about what I have in slides and more time in answering your questions if you can. So I'll move uh, pretty quickly, I hope. Let me make sure my slides are working. Okay. So if I can find the right arrows, we're good. Uh, first, some things, some places where you can get questions answered. Uh, we've just started a new within the last three weeks, uh, a new social media program with using a, an app called Periscope. And every Tuesday and Thursday, if you have credit questions about credit reports, credit scores, fraud and identity theft, whatever they might be, I'm spending 30 minutes on Periscope talking to people about those uh, issues. Uh, it's a really an open opportunity to ask questions. It's a Q&A, a live uh, interaction. So if you're into social media, Check out Periscope, and every day at 1:30 Central Time, 2:30 Eastern, uh, I experience. I'll be there Tuesdays and Thursdays at, at 2:30. So, join me if you have questions we don't get to today. For example, jump on Periscope and you learn more about what we're doing and get your questions answered. Just quickly, I want to talk about Experian and something we think of as data for good. It's a philosophy philosophy that we have at the company and it's really a big piece of why I have the job I have. Uh, and there are really three elements to it. We recognize that people are at the core of our business. We live in the world, as this says, where people are more aware of what we do, engaged in what we do. And we help people protect and manage that information and to use it to their advantage. And part of that is helping people understand how to engage with us, understanding what information is there, and how they can use it as a tool for them. So we want to make sure that we're engaging people and be more effective at that and helping people use that information that we have, whether it's a credit report or an automotive history report or a fraud prevention tool, helping people use those tools to help themselves and to be more empowered. Uh, obviously, we are big data. When you hear about big data, there are more than 220 million consumers with credit reports at Experian. We have credit histories for more than 25 million U.S. businesses, and we employ almost 3,000 technologists and more than 400 scientists around the world. We are the world's largest information services provider. In the U.S., we employ about 8,000 people. And your credit report, I should mention, never leaves the United States. Uh, we operate independently. Although our global headquarters are in London, England, your U.S. credit report stays here. Our corporate headquarters in the United States are in Costa Mesa, California, and we don't share information across national boundaries. Uh, so your personal credit report never goes anywhere else. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but we're very active and very uh, um, kind of aggressive is the right term, but really engaged in helping understand how to use data effectively to empower both businesses and consumers. And we also understand that at the heart of what we do is helping people around the world, and for me here in the U.S., really gain access to affordable, everyday essential services, credit, buying a car, as Nelson mentioned, getting insurance. And to really do that, we need to empower people by helping them understand what we do and engage with us. So that's why I have my job. I actually told my, my boss this morning I have the most fun job in the company because I get to talk to people about how to engage with us and before they have problems and make sure that I'm sharing the information with people to help them use our information to their advantage as opposed to being frustrated by it. So that's what we're, I'm, that's why I'm here. Uh, so that said, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about what's new in credit scoring first and credit reporting and what we're seeing in terms of credit scores, primarily the Vantage Score 3.0, which is the latest model, and FICO 9. Uh, there are the newest scores on the market. They're not yet widely adopted, but they are in use and, and gaining uh, traction and will be moved over to from older models uh, over time, probably over the next two to three years, so it takes some time. But what we found is that in those models, one of the key things they're doing is no longer, with Vantage Score 3.0 in particular, no longer including paid collections at all in the calculation. So if you have a collection account or collection accounts and you pay them off, they will no longer be included in the credit score calculation. So you can help your credit score tremendously by paying it off. In the past, if you had a paid collection, it helped a little bit, but it would still be weighed pretty heavily uh, and, and so wasn't as big an impact. 
FICO 9 uh, is weighing them uh, paid collection less heavily, so considerably less heavily, so uh, likewise is going to make a big difference. Unpaid collections are still going to be part of that score, still going to be calculated. The thing to understand is that even though most people, if you pay a collection, is going to help, you're likely not going to see a majority of the population because of the changes in the scores so go from having poor scores to great scores overnight. It's not because the models have also changed in the way they weigh other information. When you look at collection accounts, it was a lot made early on in the media about that change, no longer calculating uh, paid collections in the score, that it was going to suddenly help a lot of people very quickly improve their scores. And I, personally, I don't think that's the case because as this chart shows, the three quarters of the population had no collections at all. So it's not going to affect the majority of the population right away. And then only 9% had non-medical collections only. And I also are going to be uh, excluded in the same way. If you pay a medical collection, it won't be included in the report. And I have, I'll talk a little bit more about medical collections as well and the way we're going to treat them as an industry outside of the credit scores. But the bottom line is, if you have collection accounts and you pay them, it's going to help. For most people, there will be other negative information, late payments, maxed out accounts, just because of the nature of what leads to collections in most cases. So I don't think you're going to see sudden, tremendous increases for 90% of the population. I think there may be some small pockets of, of consumers who that's going to be major, a major impact, but for most, probably not a, a huge impact because even though we may have paid a collection, there's typically other information that, and the way it's weighed that's going to offset it. The scoring companies have looked at credit histories in the marketplace and they're weighing other information more heavily than that paid collection now too. So I think it's important to understand some of the nuance behind scores. Paying collection is going to be important. It's not going to solve uh, for everybody. Uh, so I think it's an important change, but be aware that it's probably not going to change everything right away. I think that's the key point and well, one of the key changes in scoring at this point. When we're looking at credit reporting, there's a number of new things that are happening right now. This spring, we reached an agreement with the New York Attorney General's Office and 31 other states to implement a number of changes. In fact, we had experienced a lot of them are already underway. We have a new plan to improve the accuracy of credit, the consumer experience, which is going to be uh, very helpful to people who are trying to understand the credit report, get help with the credit report, make sure that they uh, get the help they need and are able to use that credit report as an effective financial tool rather than have it be something that's difficult and confusing and frustrating for them. One of the things that we've already started to do is expand the resources on annualcreditreport.com and Nelson was right on the money when he said make sure the spelling's right. Annualcreditreport.com is where you get that free annual credit report under federal law. You can't get it anywhere else. So if you go to uh, freecreditscore.com, you won't get, or freecreditreport.com, you won't get, you will get a free report, but it's part of a subscription service, a trial period. Those are actually Experian companies. So I always tell people, you, you can get a free report there, but it's, you need to withdraw from that agreement because that's not the federal report. Be aware of that and be aware that the only place you get that free report is annualcreditreport.com. I will also be providing additional information to consumers who dispute information. We're already implementing a better system for providing documentation. So when you dispute now, if you go online at Experian.com to Experian.com slash dispute, you'll be able to dispute each item in your credit report. You no longer have to have a personal report before going into dispute. If you do have a personal report, we'll ask for that report number. If you do not, and you get the report, say, from a lender or a mortgage lender, somebody like that, you don't have a personal consumer report, we'll ask for some information, we'll give you one free. And you can then dispute that information right online right away. So we'll provide that free report so you don't have to have one before you come to us. Each account will also have a dispute button. So if there's something you disagree with, you click that dispute button and it goes into the cart, you enter your dispute, and it will also have a link to upload any documentation that you may have. So if you have emails or documents that you've 
scanned into the computer system or had sent to you, you can upload those along with the dispute. We'll send all of that information to the, the source of that, of that account information, and they'll be able to take that into consideration. So we're making that process much smoother and much easier for, for individuals to, to go through. When we look at credit reporting, a number of other issues that are underway uh, that I think are going to be very important. One is, is medical collections. We will no longer report medical collections as soon as they're reported to us. We won't add them to the report. We're going to wait six months before we include medical collections that are reported to us to ensure that they are actually accurate collections and not a billing error or an insurance delay, things of that sort. So medical collections won't be appearing right away on the credit report. I think that's going to be an important change. In the past, we uh, reported medical collections and they remained as paid. Once paid now, we're going to remove those medical collections. So they'll no longer be there once a medical collection is paid. They'll come off the report right away. Uh, we're going to be improving the, the standards and reinforcing the standards that lenders have to report information to us so that it's more consistent, more accurate, uh, more thorough. We'll also be prohibiting data furnishers from reporting authorized users. Without a date of birth, we want to make sure that if someone's reported as an authorized user that we know that they're an adult and not a child. That will help us reject data uh, that doesn't meet that requirement. We'll be eliminating debts that didn't arise from a contract or agreement. That's from our lawyer side. What that means is we're not going to include tickets or fines, things like library fines or parking tickets anymore in the credit report. We're going to be removing those. We're working with the Consumer Data Industry Association and our competitors some of the programs are already in place. Others will be implemented over the next 18 to 24 months. So it's a sort of a drawn out process. But we have to reach agreement with our competitors and our industry reporting standards to make sure that we're all consistent in the way we're reporting that information and collecting it. So it's going to take a bit of time. Uh, but again, what we can do independently, experience already doing what we have to work with on our competitors, we're going to work through over time. Uh, but should be implemented within the next 24 months at most. When you come to Experian, I just wanted to share some things that we've already done. We've upgraded our website to make it much easier. If you go to Experian.com and go to Consumer Assistance, you'll see a page that looks a lot like this. You'll be able to click on Disputes, and it will take you right into that process. If you want to add a freeze or lift a freeze, you can click on Security Freeze. If you've been denied credit, click on that button, and you'll be able to request a free report. If you've been a victim of identity theft, you can go right to that section. What we want to do is make it as easy and fast as possible for a person to get to the information they need so that they can get the help they need right away. And we're also adding additional agents and our representatives to help get on the phone more quickly. We're adding bilingual support, adding additional Spanish-speaking uh, agents so that they can help uh, Spanish-speaking consumers, and again, we've up updated the system to dispute documents electronically, making it much faster, much easier, and much simpler to do. So just that gives you some sense, I hope, of some of the things that are happening that are new in the industry and changing uh, that, uh, and that are really intended to help people engage with us more effectively. So from there, I wanted to talk about credit scores in general, and what I think of as our Credit Rockstar versus Credit Roadie survey that we did last spring, and I thought it was very telling in terms of what affects credit scores and helping people understand what they need to do to have very good or great credit scores. And it really comes down to managing your credit report. What we did was we looked at six different categories of information, the most common categories of information that go into a credit score of any kind, whether it's FICO or Vantage Score or others. And in this case, we looked at Vantage Score, which now has an Vantage Score 3.0, which has a scale that goes to 850, uh, reflective of, of the FICO score, so pretty similar in comparison. And just to give you some sense of what we looked at, one, the first thing was age is a virtue. What we found was that people who had longer credit histories had better credit scores. I don't think there's any real surprise there. People with what we thought of as super prime scores, scores above 820 or so, had had credit histories that were 27 years or longer. So on average, were 27 years old. When you look at deep subprime borrowers, people with scores below uh, about 500, 
they, were, they had histories of about nine years. So the older the history, the better. No real surprise there. And I don't think any of these surprised me, but some of them in the difference was shocking in terms of how wide the difference was, particularly when you look at number two, when what I call don't push the limit, keeping your utilization rate low. Utilization is always the second most important factor in credit scores, your balance to limit ratio. So if you add up all of your balances on your credit cards, divide by the total limits on your credit cards, you get a balance to limit ratio or utilization rate. What we found was super prime borrowers had on average a utilization rate of 8%, less than 10%. When we saw deep subprime borrowers, the utilization rate on average was 99%. So if you're carrying high balances as compared to your limits, it's going to have a significant impact on your scores. I think there was a very clear issue here. Uh, people with poor scores had very high balances and consistently had very high balances. So uh, another question I'm often asked is what's the ideal utilization rate? The answer is zero. With the lower, the better. And I think that's borne out here. Super prime borrowers had very low utilization rates, less than 10% on average. Deep subprime borrowers were maxing out their cards. So if you can pay those balances in full each month, that's ideal. One of the fastest ways to improve a credit score is to reduce your balances on your credit cards. And that's, that's sort of borne out by these numbers. Another question we issue we looked at were inquiries, and it, it sometimes it proved that it does hurt to ask. You should limit the number of inquiries you had. When we looked at super prime borrowers, only 69% had not, or 69% for me had applied for credit in the last year. So somewhere like around 30, only 31% had actually applied for any credit in the previous year. When you look at deep subprime, 43% had not applied for credit. So about half, had a, a more than half, 60% or so, or maps a little off, but 57% had applied for credit in the last year. So they applied more, had much higher balances. So the combination of things really worked against them. People with really good scores had very low balances and were not applying for a lot of new credit. They applied for credit when they needed it and not just because they could. And I think that was a significant issue. We also looked at keeping balances low on cards other and other revolving debt. Sometimes what we found is less is more. It's sort of another look at utilization. Super prime borrowers had on average balances of about $2,600, between $2,600 to $2,700, and they had an average of five credit cards. That doesn't say much, I mean, it sounds bad, as compared to deep subprime, when you see that they, on average they had one credit card and a balance of only $588. Unfortunately for deep subprime borrowers, they usually only had one or two cards and with very low credit limits. So in the end, they were maxing out those credit card, the B credit card they had when using it as cash in many ways uh, and getting into trouble. So use, keeping those balances low as compared to the limits was very important. And number five, and I guess I said six, we've looked at five categories. It never pays to be late. This is an obvious one, I think. But when you look at the statistics around subprime borrowers versus deep subprime borrowers, it becomes even more clear. When we looked at super prime borrowers, we found that 100% had no late payments. Super prime borrowers did not miss payments. Deep subprime borrowers, only 18% had no late payments. So you know, about 82% of deep subprime borrowers had late payments on their credit reports, which means they missed a full billing cycle, so a full 30 days. Uh, so significant late payments, high balances are the keys to credit reports. There are credit scores. There's really no secret to credit scores. You have to pay your bills on time. You have to keep your balances low. I thought the statistics, though, that as we did the survey were a little bit surprising to me. I didn't realize it would be so starkly different. Um, so I, I think it's important to share and really interesting to me. And it really drives on that point. That you have to do some common sense things to have good credit scores, namely take care of your credit report, pay your bills on time, keep your balances low, and your scores will be fine. Um, and, but there are some other things we can think about. The longer you use credit well, the better your scores will become. Not applying for too much credit at any one time is important as well. Uh, and, so, and so that's kind of what I wanted to share. If you're interested in engaging with us uh, at other times, I mentioned the credit scope, which is new for us. I'm active on Twitter, as is Experian. Uh, if you, so if you go to at Experian, um, you, you'll be able to 
see our Twitter feeds. We have a credit chat every Wednesday at 3 o'clock Eastern. So if you go to hashtag credit chat, there are several services. tchat.io is one, and you can log in and you can join us on those conversations. But we were talking, Nelson and I were talking about Ask Experian. That was my first responsibility, was writing Ask Experian when I joined the company, and that was almost 19 years ago. We get almost 2,500 questions a month on average uh, to submitted to Ask Experian around credit reports and credit scores and fraud and ID theft, and we answer those questions. We have them archived. So you can go there, go to experian.com slash education, and you'll find Ask Experian along with other things like videos about credit reporting issues, uh, blogs around credit reports and credit scores and other topics. So use those resources. I encourage you to visit those sites uh, and uh, take advantage of them. And with that, I'll stop and open to any questions you might have. Uh, Aubrey, do you want me to turn it over to you then? Um, Rod, I'm actually going to read the questions to you. OK. The first question we had is, will there be any changes in the way student loans are being reported? And at this point, none that I'm aware of. Uh, the student loans are treated like any other installment loan at this point. And the difference that people often see is that, or don't understand, is that when you take out a student loan, you usually take out a new loan every semester or every period. Um, and so you'll see, you may see, is if you go to school four years, you take a loan each semester, you might see, for example, eight uh, student loans for smaller amounts, but you make one payment for a large amount, uh, and so be aware of that if you get your credit report. But uh, they're treated currently as any other installment loan, and I'm not aware of any changes at this point uh, in terms of how they would be reported to us. Now, or, or how they'll be weighed in scores either, uh, for that matter. I haven't heard anything different. OK, thank you. The next question is, I know the situation with two sisters. Their social security numbers are one digit apart. Mm -hmm. When one sister applied for a loan, she found out that her sister's credit accounts were on her credit report. They had been combined as though they were one person. Their sister tried to correct her report, but they said that the other sister would need to contact them. What is the best way to handle that situation? Yeah. Um, it's what we call a mixed file. And it, typically, it happens with a father and a son who share the same name and the son's a junior or a second or a third. Um, so fortunately, it's not common, but it's, that's the most common source. In this case, the best thing to do is for each sister to request their credit reports. They'll be asked for, on all likely be asked to send us some documentation to verify their identity. And they'll be able to work with us to, for lack of a better term, flag that file. Uh, one of the initiatives that we're going through right now is developing a way to even more effectively prevent the, the files from becoming recombined, if you will. Um, it's important that the sisters use full identifying information, uh, including the social security numbers, but names, address, and so on, when they apply for credit. We actually don't just match to a social security number. We match to every piece of identifying information uh, to make sure that we don't confuse the files. Um, so be sure they use full identifying information and contact us, dispute them as, as mixed files, uh, and use that terminology. I think that will help too. They'll tell our representatives they have a mixed file with a sister and we'll be able to uncombine them and keep them separate. Okay, great. Thank you. The next question is, most of my clients do not have computer access to correct online. Open for suggestions on where to mail the documents. Mm -hmm. um, and I can get the address. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. It's, it, it will be, uh, it's mail your disputes to Experian. And it's, and I'll give you the wrong PO box. PO box, let me get the, the PO box to you, back to you. Uh, PO box, I want to say 2002, but that may be wrong. So don't quote me on that. Um, and it will be Allen, Texas, zip code 75013. But let me verify the PO box, and you'll be able to send disputes there. OK, great. Thank you. The next question is, how can I speak with a person if I don't do Twitter? 
Um, to, with regard to your credit report, what you'll need to do is get a copy of your credit report or uh, if you need to dispute, go online and we'll provide that copy. Um, and it will include a toll-free telephone number that you can call. And it's and I smile, and you can't see me on the webinar, but I'm kind of smiling, tongue in cheek. It's a wonderful automated phone system. Um, but that's another one of the initiatives is improving that, that automated uh, connection. And you'll be able to get through, speak to a representative, and they'll be able to assist you. Um, so that's the best way to, to speak to a representative specific to your own credit report. Uh, one of the things I can't do is answer questions specifically specifically to an individual's credit history um, because I don't have access to reports and if I tried to do that I would be wrong um, there's, because they're all unique. But get that report and then you, there'll be a toll-free telephone number you can call. Thank you. The next question is how accurate is Credit Karma? Um, what I can say about Credit Karma is they're a competitor to Experian. Uh, they use a credit score, from what I understand, I think a couple of different ones. Um, in terms of accuracy, what, I, what I'll say is this. Every credit score that you get online outside of a lending situation is an educational score. It's a score that will help you understand where you fall generally in terms of risk um, and help you understand what the score means and, help you, and, and should provide a, a list of the risk factors that are affecting that score, uh, regardless of where you get it. That doesn't mean they're not valuable and useful uh, because they, they really do help you know where you are in terms of risk and what you need to do to improve those scores. Um, but you'll, they'll almost never match what your lender gets. And there are a number of reasons for that. One, the lender might use a different scoring model. Uh, if you're getting a mortgage, they're going to have a different score than a, a lender for autos, for cars. Uh, credit unions use different scores than credit card providers. So there are lots of different scores. So I always tell people, don't worry about matching the number you get to a lender's number because it, it's not going to happen. What you'll find is that regardless of where you get the score, they tend to represent the same level of risk. And more important, they should provide those risk factors that tell you what you need to work on from your credit report because those risk factors tend to be very consistent from one score to another. So even though the numbers might be very different, the risk factors will almost certainly be the same or almost identical. Excuse me, and you'll know what you need to work on, which is what those scores are really all about. So get your report before you apply for credit. Get a score. I try to buy a score at least once a year uh, so that I get a sense of what's going on in my credit history uh, and recommend other people do too. They're usually about $15, something like that, and you get the score, the, the scale, an explanation of what it means and the factors, and the factors are what really empower you as a consumer. Okay, the next question is, how can consumers know when they are next eligible for the next three credit reports to be an annual credit report or by other means? Sure. Um, from an annualcreditreport.com standpoint, it is not calendar year. So jot down the date you request your report, and on that date, the next year, you can request another free report. So it's, it's based on when you get this 12 months from the date you request it. Uh, so that's why people you sometimes say spread them out so you get an experience report today and a few months later get a transunion and a few months after that get Equifax and you can spread them across or you can get them all at once. Uh, so that's annualcreditreport.com. If you want reports outside of that, you can get your credit report as often as you like. Um, it's not going to hurt credit scores. It's not going to be shown to other lenders. Uh, if you exhaust all of the free resources, you'll need to pay for a report. But you can get a free report if you're unemployed seeking employment, if you're a victim of fraud or identity theft, uh, if you've had adverse action taken, like not gotten the best rates or been declined. So there are a number of reasons to get free reports that most people, would, if they're asking for a report, would qualify for before you would have to pay for it. Um, you know, so, and that also goes to monitoring, the monitoring service. You can get your report as often as you like through the service. It's not going to affect 
uh, credit scores or, or your lending decisions. Okay, great. Next question. Is there an advantage on the FICO score if a collection account in, in versus settle for lesser? Is there an advantage on the FICO score if a collection account is settled for a lesser amount? Yeah. Um, it, ideally, it would be paid in full. What would show on a credit report if you negotiated settlement is settled. It, it will say settled for less than agreed. That's still very negative. You're likely not going to see much, if any, improvement. Um, with the new models, if it's not reported paid in full, it's still going to stay on the report, so it'll still be included. So settled may not cause it to be excluded from the, the score calculation. It may need to say paid in full. Um, I verify you know, that's something I, I would need to, to verify, uh, but I think that's a good rule of thumb. I mean, it needs to be paid in full. Settled is is going to be negative. Um, it's only slightly less negative than not paid at all. Okay. Next question is: I have noticed several clients that I'm working with have paid collection items, which cause their FICO score to drop. I realize over time it will increase, but for the moment, it really discourages the consumer as they are looking for an in for an increase in the credit score. Um, what happens is when you pay a kind of account like that, there's a change in the history, so it can cause a score to dip a bit. Usually within a month or two, within a billing cycle or two, it's going to bounce up to where it was or higher. So that's important to change, whether, and that has to do with um, any kind of change in the report. Uh, one of the things I tell people is don't make it, don't expect an instant improvement with anything you do uh, because it's going to wait till the end of the billing cycle. Credit scores, if you look at the, the graph for a credit score, you'll never see a smooth curve or a straight line going up. It's going to kind of zigzag like the stock market, only we hope not like lately where there's been huge spikes in the market, but little zigzags. Um, so that's the first issue. It's going to, probably going to cause an, an, an initial slight dip uh, because of uncertainty as to what that means. It's just a change, um, but then it will come back up, first issue. Second issue is if it's a collection account, they pay that collection account in future scores, it's going to come off completely, so they're going to see an immediate change. Um, the third issue I would say is that by paying that collection, if their intent of paying a collection is so they can then go apply for new credit, they're missing the point. They're probably going to get right back into the trouble they had before. Uh, they couldn't pay those debts, and now they're looking to pay it off so they can get more debt. If that's the, the psychology, if that's the thought process, they probably need to be counseled on what what their plan is. Um, you know, if they've had issues managing their debts, if they're having financial difficulties, the score really doesn't matter. Uh, and I tell people that all the time. If you're in a situation where you're trying to rebuild your financial standing, you shouldn't be worried about credit scores because you probably shouldn't be going out applying for new debt right away anyway. Um, you know, there are other circumstances. You need to apply for an apartment. You need to do those things. So, um, and I understand that, but, you know, that's one of the things I run into often. And I hear people tell me that with bankruptcy. I just declared bankruptcy. When can I get new credit? You probably shouldn't right away. Um, you know, so it's the thought process that I always ask about, too. Um, so, I guess my, my position is if you've just paid off a collection account, I wouldn't be worried too much about the scores because you're taking the right steps. Um, there are probably other things you need to address as well. Um, you know, if you pay a collection, you no longer owe that debt. Do you have other outstanding debts? Do you have high balances? Since you no longer have to make those payments, you can maybe put them toward, put that, the money you would spend there toward other uh, accounts to help you improve your credit report more quickly. Um, you know, it shouldn't be discouraging. If you've paid off a debt, it should be encouraging because now you have less debt to, that you owe, and you'll be able to get to a better place faster. So that's sort of my roundabout take on it. Okay. The next question is, if the three credit bureaus are using the same info, why are the scores different? Yeah. Um, several reasons. One, we don't always have the same information. Uh, credit reporting is voluntary in the U.S. 
So a lender doesn't have to report to us at all, and they don't or they aren't required to report to all three. So they might report to Experian and not TransUnion and Equifax, for example. So it could be that there's information on our report that's not on the other. So that can affect scores. The second issue is often related to when information is updated. So a lender may update information with Experian today, but it might not get updated with TransUnion or Equifax until tomorrow or the, the next day, something like that. So the information not, might not be exactly the same, which can cause usually fairly small differences in scores. Uh, the third reason is they're looking at different scores. You know, I often talk to people who say, I got my report and I, bought it, and I got a score from Equifax and I got one from you and I got one from Experian. And the scores are very different, and the reason is they're looking at different scores. So they're looking at a Vantage score from one, a FICO 9 from another, and a, say a FICO 3 from uh, another. Uh, so they're just different scores. So there are a number of reasons that they might be, might be different. And that's why I tell people don't focus too much on the number itself and don't try to compare them directly. Instead, look at what you get with those numbers and what those numbers represent in terms of risk because they all should tell you that. If you get three different numbers, but they all represent that you're an excellent credit risk, the numbers are different, but they mean the same thing. So you shouldn't worry about that. And that's usually what happens. The other thing to focus on are the factors you get with the scores, and they typically are going to be the same. And so focus on those factors to work on your credit report, and all of your scores will get better. But don't worry too much about, and don't try to compare the numbers from three different sources because there are a lot of reasons they might be different, but they still would likely represent the same level of credit risk. Okay. Do you have time for one more question? Sure. And then, okay. The last question that we're taking today is, are there any consumer implications as a result of some lenders using a FICO score and some using a Vantage score? Do consumers usually know that beforehand? Um, most lenders use more than one score in their lending decisions, and I don't think people realize that. Um, but it doesn't, there's no real advantage one way or the other because what happens is the lender determines what scoring models they're going to use and what risk levels are acceptable. So one lender isn't going to compare the score you get with the score you get from another lender. The lenders are going to look at that information independently, and depending on their toler risk tolerance, they may approve you at one lender and may decline you at another. But it's not really related to the score, it's related to the, that particular lender's risk tolerance. The other thing you'll find is that what will happen is, even though you get two different numbers, again, they're going to represent the same level of risk. So in most cases, if you're approved at one lender, you'll be approved at another, unless you're just a really borderline situation in terms of, of risk and then it might be a bit different. But in most cases, if you have good scores on one credit scoring model, like the Vantage score, you're going to have good FICO scores too. And so uh, again, I think people worry too much about the number itself instead of what's making that number what it is. Um, so don't try to compare one number to another. Instead, look at the risk level it represents. And I think you'll find that they, even though the numbers are different, they're going to represent the same level of risk. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And then the last question, and then we'll um, conclude because we're five minutes over the hour. The last question that we have is, is the address for disputing a credit um, report, um, for filing dispute on the credit report? Yes. Yes. So if, when you get a report, uh, if you go to experience.com slash dispute, um, and go through that process, you can dispute online. When you get your report, it will include a toll-free telephone number to call us. It will include a mailing address to dispute, and it will include a, the, the website. So you'll get all three. Uh, and that's really the best way to get that address. That way you have your report, you're looking at it, uh, and you'll know exactly what you're trying to dispute anyway uh, and be able to send it to us. So that, yeah, yes, is the short answer. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And so I thank you for joining today. Nelson had another, some more resources that he wanted to provide. Nelson, do you want to give that information now? Rod, can you change over to Nelson to make him the presenter, please? Nope. I just did. I just want to show my screen so that uh, people know how to reach us later. 
Uh, you already got a lot of resources. Uh, you can reach us at our San Francisco office headquarters in LA. I'm at the LA office. And your consumers can contact us directly if they have questions or, or issues or complaints uh, at the number listed at the bottom there or right at the website. They can uh, write to us and we can respond to their questions or complaints. I want to say thanks very much to Rod. Uh, it, it's quite a, quite a, quite a, um, honor to have you on and, and take so many questions. I know that the network, our network is very appreciative of you being on it and taking the time to answer the questions. And I'm thankful to Capital One for the continued partnership and support of MoneyWise. Uh, and that's it for me. Reach us at this address and we may send a couple more resources later by email.